In today's final video about The Legend of Vox Machina Season 1, I'm going to be going into spoilers. So if you have not watched The Legend of Vox Machina, even if you have watched the first campaign but you haven't watched the show yet, I would strongly advise you to not watch this until after you have finished all 12 episodes of the first season because I will be getting into some spoilers here and I really don't like spoiling things for people. So I'm gonna give you three seconds here to go ahead and click away. Yep. All right, that should be about three seconds now. So hopefully all of the losers who haven't finished The Legend of Vox Machina season one are gone. You're not a loser if you are still here, but you should leave if you haven't finished it. Loser. Oh, snap. Legend of Vox Machina season one. I have some criticism and I have some praise that I want to go into. This is not going to be a review of the whole season because I already did my entire season review on Monday. You can go ahead and watch that by clicking up here. I'll put a little thingy, I don't remember what it's called, but one of those up there to link to the video if you want to see my actual review of the entire season. This is just going to be me talking about some critiques and some praises that I have for it that I couldn't really get into in the previous videos because I was doing them spoiler free. First, I want to talk about something really positive, which is going to be the coolest moments in the show. There are a ton of really cool moments here and I couldn't possibly list all of them in this video and do other things because that would take up the entire video. Instead I'm just going to pick my top three although there are others that are definitely strong contenders. I'm going to begin with the professor's death. Now I do have my issues with the fight with the professor which I will be getting into shortly in more detail than I did during my review of that episode but regardless of my complaints or gripes regarding the fight against Professor Anders I did really like his death. I thought that was an awesome scene. Having Percy just fire off a bullet that ricochets around the room and then take takes off the source of Professor Anders's power and then walking out to him and sticking the heated barrel up into the wound and causing it to like sizzle and burn and then firing and blowing his head off and shoving the body through the broken window. That was a really epic and intense death scene. This next one actually goes by pretty quickly and it is going to be Grog and the giant. This is a scene where Scanlan picks up Grog with uh, Scanlan's hand and chucks him at the giant and then Grog lands on its head and then begins to chop his way down the middle. He does this while Vax is simultaneously cutting down his own giant and like ripping its eyes out and all of this like it's pretty intense and disgusting so they're both simultaneously cutting these down almost like a competition of trying to bring the giant down first but Grog is going at it in a way that really only Grog can while Vax is doing his difficult rogue thing Grog is going full barbarian and he is just hacking and slashing away at the giant from the top down just eliminating chunks of this thing from top to groin until the giant just falls in half and Grog is covered in gore and grime and it was not not only hilarious, but very true to his character and also just a really cool moment. I really enjoyed watching Grog just kind of slide down the screen as more and more of the giant slips apart. I thought that was a pretty cool scene. Given that I've praised two really gory scenes here, it's probably not a good look for me, is it? But the next scene that I want to praise and probably the scene that I enjoyed the most from this entire season is Percy's visions in the 12th episode. These were phenomenally well done. I really enjoyed them. They were trippy and weird and there was a lot of really cool effects that they were using in them really interesting animations and strong choices for the way that it was kind of parallel in the real world with the visions that Percy was having and how he was perceiving things. It was really awesome. I loved it and I feel like it was one of the coolest visual scenes that they had in the entire season. It was a lot of fun to watch. I watched it through a couple of times and it's just awesome. And Orthax as well in the scene and in the visions and all of that and also in the real world as Orthax is spiraling around him was just man. What an awesome scene. That was definitely one of the coolest moments for me. There was something specific that I talked about very early on about the look of the show that I feel like I can touch on in more detail here and even show some clips of regarding what I mean when it comes to it. And that's going to be the fight against the Iron Storm. A lot of people really like this. I think that as an idea, it sounds really cool and could have been executed very well. And in fact, the animation is strong. Everything in that fight is strong except for the actual look. And that's because they use a 3D model for the Iron Storm and they just, they didn't composite and animate him and and add filters and all of that in a way that would make him cohesive with the rest of the scene. So instead, when you watch the battle scene with the Iron Storm, the dragon sticks out like a sore thumb and he looks like he doesn't belong there. Now, granted, nothing really looks like anything that's around it because the characters are animated in ways that the sets aren't because the sets are static images and such that they've created and paintings that they've done. And I don't know exactly how they did all of it, but they're clearly a different art style than the characters. But that's a lot more forgivable than a very obvious 3D model being present in the show without enough filters 
colors or appropriate lighting applied to make it mesh well with the rest of the cast. It also appeared to be animated at perhaps a different frame rate than the characters were, which I know you kind of expect a 3D model to be animated at a far different frame rate than the actual hand-drawn characters, but I feel like if they had just taken some more time with the dragon and really made it blend and mesh well with the rest of the scene and with the other characters so that it looked a lot more like them, it would have been way easier for me to stomach the fact that this was going to be part of the show. Instead, it just wound up looking really uncanny throughout the fight and like it didn't match and it wasn't really there with the rest of the party. And then I had some other visual gripes that I've mentioned throughout the entirety of uh, all of my reviews because they weren't really spoilers, things like missing frames and that sort of thing. I don't think I need to go into all of that. If you've noticed the missing frames, then you get it. If you haven't, then you should continue to enjoy the show as you do. I'm sure somebody out there has done like a really critical examination of Legend of Vox Machina and found all of the dropped frames, but for me, it's just they were few and far between. They happen occasionally. It sucked when I saw them. It sucked when I noticed them and they really stood out to me. But for the most part, there weren't a ton of them by the time I got to the end of the series. And I think that in the last three episodes, I didn't really notice any dropped frames, except for a couple of moments that were really quick and didn't really stand out unless I was actually looking for that, as opposed to the moments that really stood out to me and just felt like scenes that were not polished as well as they should have been. Okay, now this is something that I mentioned in a couple of previous reviews, and that's going to be the healing and resurrection. At the time of me filming this, they have not talked about the final three episodes, so I don't know if they mentioned this, but I really feel like we need a stronger establishment of how the healing and resurrection in this world is going to work, because I'm really not clear on it, and I am very vehemently against resurrection unless it is done really well and is done very sparingly. And I know that D&D resurrection is a very common thing, although I try my best at my table to make it an extremely costly thing, and I know that Matt does the same, so it seems odd to me how frequently characters would be getting resurrected in this show. It feels like they should have nixed some deaths or made resurrection a much bigger deal than they did. However, there is one thing that I want to note is that I believe it's Pike that says after Keyleth is killed that Keyleth isn't dead yet. She's just mostly dead. She's still alive, but barely. And with her being only mostly dead, it means that they're not actually reviving her and restoring her to life. They are just healing her and getting rid of whatever awfulness is about to kill her. Which, given the method that they used to heal her in episode 12, would also mean that Cassandra wasn't dead. She was just almost dead in that scene where Keyleth healed her with the exact same mechanics. Cassandra? And that would quell my fears. If we could officially establish that neither Cassandra or Keyleth were actually dead, they were just dying and were nearly dead and they had like a few seconds. If this was like a revivify sort of situation as opposed to a resurrection sort of situation. So the person is mostly dead, they're pretty much gone, but there's still a chance to bring them back and restore them. That would be a little bit better for me and a lot easier for me to swallow than, oh, we had two resurrections in the span of a few episodes, because that's a lot. And I'm just really hoping that they're not making resurrections so easy that you can just spit on some dirt, have Scanlan sing a song, and then a person comes back to life. Short halt! That is way too easy. I also really don't want to see them use the, oh, they're tired right now, so they can't heal them, because again, that's just going to feel kind of cheap. I get that they're kind of trying to translate spell slots and stuff, but this isn't D&D, this is a TV show, and that's only going to take you so far. So I'm really hoping that we get some more solidifying of the healing and resurrection mechanics of the show's world during the second season. Okay, there are two things that I have touched on that a lot of people really didn't like what I had to say about. The first one is going to be the fight against Professor Anders. When I talked about this episode, I couldn't get into spoilers about it, so I just kind of hinted at what my problem was. My problem with this is that Anders has shown himself to be three things by the time we get to this fight. He is arrogant, he is a coward, and he is intelligent. Oh, sons of bitches, with all of that in mind, and with what we've seen of him fighting Percy in the episode prior, it feels like Anders should have been trying to escape. Yes, I know that he would have wanted Percy to see Anders as he was having all these people do his killing for him, and would probably even want to be the one who dealt the killing blow, or would want to be a part of that in some way. But at the same time, he also wants to live, he wants to survive. I don't think that he was in this house expecting to die, he expected to win. And so when he had the opportunity, he should have gotten to safety instead of standing right in front of the that big window, which was very obviously going to play a part in his eventual death. this lummox and made him rip you apart right away. And he really just stood there throughout the entire battle, which made killing him super easy. And it also made it really hard for me to suspend my disbelief because while Vox Machina has shown itself to be very uncoordinated and discombobulated, they should have figured out that they could just kill Anders and get rid of everything a lot sooner, especially because earlier on in the season, they even mentioned that if we get rid of Silas, his charms go away. 
If we beat Silas, his charm on Uriel will fade. So it would kind of naturally lead you to believe that if you get rid of Anders, his charms would go away as well. And instead, they just kept fighting all of Anders' machinations when they could have just shot and killed him. If all of them had ganged up on him at once, whatever was fighting them would have just dissipated. And that's also what we see. As soon as Anders loses his tongue, whatever is fighting them stops moving and stops attacking them. They should have done that a lot sooner. And even though they know that's how that works and it's established that they know that that's how the charms worked, they suddenly forget all of that until it's convenient for the combat scene toward the end. During this time, Andros has done nothing to escape. I personally would have liked to have him perhaps charm Grog very early on and convince Grog to carry him away. Another thing that I think would have really worked for this and made it really cool, but it would have required another episode. After Cassandra is healed, Anders possesses all of Vox Machina and tells him to go and kill Percy. Percy escapes with Cassandra or Cassandra leads him away and runs away with him. They meet up with Archie and we get an episode of the three of them establishing their relationships and their histories and all of that. And then they go back to the house once they've had an opportunity to regroup and kind of recover and plan. They go back to the house and they fight Anders in a manner that is more stealthy and not a direct approach because a direct approach against Anders is going to lead to him running away again. Because again, while he is arrogant, he's also cowardly and true to his character and expecting that he's going to run away. They know they have to sneak and try to get a hit in on him. And so Percy, Cassandra, and Archie go in. They kind of find a way to get to Anders. They kill him without harming Vox Machina and then everything is restored and it's all better. We get a whole other episode that helps to establish Percy and Cassandra as well as Archie and gets us more connected to Archie before he is killed. Again, I told you there's going to be spoilers here. That's just me wishful thinking. That's what I think I would have liked to see. But if we couldn't get a whole episode of that, at least another minute or two of Percy maybe trying to escape the situation, running away from them and finding Anders after Anders has run away, there just should have been a better way to do that. And then having Anders just stand there and having Vox Machina ignore the very obvious solution to their problem. I didn't even get the impression watching through that combat that any of them were trying to hit Anders until the very end, right before Vex gets possessed. Not for this. Not for this. That's my complaint. That's my gripe with the Anders fight. I think that there were probably other ways to fix it than adding a whole other episode, but Anders just should have been more of a slippery guy than he actually wound up being in this episode. So that's my complaint with that episode. Let me know what you think. The next thing that people really didn't like that I had to say was in episode nine, what we got with Percy's character development. And that is that Percy suddenly steps into a leadership role, but the scene and really everything in this episode wasn't earned in regards to Percy. And that's the complaint that I have here. And I do have a suggested fix for this that doesn't involve adding an entire episode, it just involves adding some scenes and changing a couple of things around. My problem with this episode is that it wasn't established early on that Percy did not want to lead and was not capable of leading until we get to the ninth episode, and then they just really keep driving it home. Percy doesn't want to lead, he has no interest in this, he only cares about killing the Briarwoods, and he has no plans at all for Whitestone after that. There's no real establishment of the fact that Percy doesn't want to lead and that he doesn't feel he's qualified or equipped until we get to this episode, and then it is just shoved down our throats throughout the entirety of it, that not only does he not want to lead, but Cassandra thinks he should lead. First of all, what's that next move? You're asking me? You're the leader, Archibald. They're losing heart, Percy. Say something to them. I can't. Julius was supposed to rule, not me. Julius is gone, and I've been with the Briarwoods for years. No one trusts me. You are next in line. The long lost Rolo. Now it's your turn to lead them. It can't be me, Cassandra. I'm not a leader. I ran. But you're here now. Yours wasn't the only life shattered that day. We're all here. The time is now. No one else can do this. So it just doesn't feel like not only his conflict with the idea of leadership is earned, but it also doesn't feel like his sudden willingness to take up an era of leadership is earned either. And on top of that, he doesn't actually end up being willing to take on leadership role. He believes that Cassandra is more equipped for that. And we see that at the end of the season when he has her stay behind as the leader of Whitestone and she's kind of concerned they're going to reject her and all of that. Will you stay and rebuild? Adorolo has watched over this land for 200 years. My entire adult life has been driven by fear and vengeance. That's not the temperament of a leader. But you, Cass, of all our family, you were the bravest. You are the true heir to Whitestone. Me? Here is what I think could have helped this scene be a lot more believable and also develop the characters a little bit better. First, we establish early on in the season that Percy doesn't want to lead 
and that he will shun opportunities to lead or that he will get cold feet or hesitate and just doesn't want to do that. My suggestion would be maybe having uh, Vex, who typically is the one who is sharding and barking the orders. She's indisposed. She's not able to do anything and someone looks to Percy for guidance. Probably Vax looks to Percy for guidance and hopes that Percy will have an idea and Percy keeps looking at Vex or he keeps looking at the rest of the group and he's like I don't I don't have a, a single leadership bone in me right like he freezes he hesitates and it almost gets them killed until Vex can finally break herself free of whatever it is she's doing and she saves the day probably saving Scanlan or something. And then we get a little typical Vex dig at Percy in after that where she kind of digs at him and, and says something that's pretty mean about the fact that he got cold feet or froze and uh, was not good under pressure and didn't want to take on a leadership position. Even in an instant where people were relying on him to take action and be part of the group. That's just me spitballing. I'm sure that there are much better opportunities for that sort of thing. But having Percy reject the opportunity to be a leader early on and then maybe sprinkling in a couple of other moments of him saying that I don't want to lead, I'm not a leader, that sort of thing would be really strong to establishing the fact that, okay, Percy, not a leader, no interest in leading, great. And then we get to this episode where he has to be the one to spark the rebellion. He has to be the one to put hope in their hearts. It doesn't matter that he doesn't want to lead. It doesn't matter that he's qualified to be a leader. This has to come from the heir to Whitestone. This has to come from Percival Dorolo. And that is when Vex, not Cassandra, Vex tells him to snap out of it, grow a pair, and give the people what they want to hear. He doesn't even have to believe it himself, but they need to hear it and they need to hear it come from him. This lets Percy have a sort of cop out of, I'm not a leader, but I'm willing to be what these people need me to be in order to save my home. And specifically in order to make sure that I get to the Briarwoods, which are my ultimate goal. That leaves it open for him to very easily step down again later on and say to Cassandra that she's the one who needs to take over and that he's really not a leader. And he only gave that speech because he knew that it needed to come from him at the time. This is just me spitballing an idea here that I think could probably work for making Percy's sudden step into leadership feel more believable and more consistent with his character and not suddenly force him into a position where he is abruptly the leader of Whitestone, but he didn't want to lead, but we didn't know that he didn't want to lead because it wasn't alluded to as strongly as it could have been. I've watched the season through a few times and we get a couple of hints that he doesn't really care about leading Whitestone, but it's just not enough to really establish it and that's why they kind of ham fist it in episode 9 and it just didn't come off as well as it could have as a character development moment, especially when we have so many other character development moments throughout the season that are really great. Okay, now the humor. I have ragged on the humor throughout this. I've said that there are a lot of jokes that just really didn't land well, a lot of them that are just repeats of the same thing, and a lot of them that are more about making fun of the characters than uh, having the jokes delivered by the characters. But there are still some really great jokes in here, and especially in the last few episodes, some excellent moments of humor that genuinely made me laugh. And I'm gonna show a couple of clips of some of those jokes that I really like, just to kind of highlight them here. Uh, I don't wanna do a sizzle reel of all of the jokes that I thought were stupid because that would take forever for me to go through and edit and I don't think anybody's really going to enjoy that. I think that if you have watched through the entire season, it's really easy for you to notice the jokes that are really being repeated and hammered home and aren't all that fun to watch over and over again. So I'm not going to do those ones again. It really is just going to depend on your own sense of humor. I feel like the humor is the most subjective thing about this show because it's greatly dependent on who's watching it, what they're going to find funny. Which also means that just because I'm about to list some of the things that I found to be really funny doesn't mean that you're going to find these funny and you might think I'm weird for finding these to be some of the funniest moments in the show. But here we go. So the first one is going to be the literal jaw drop from the zombie when it sees Pike. I thought it was really quick and witty and it really made me laugh out loud and I still enjoy seeing it anytime that I rewatch it. A literal jaw drop. If you have a zombie, you've got to do a literal jaw drop. <laughs> The next three moments that I found to be really funny have to do with Grog. And I've mentioned in the last video I did, I believe that the problem with a lot of the humor was that much of it was at Grog's expense and it was just haha, Grog's stupid. And in these we see, yeah, Grog's kind of a lovable idiot, but the humor is being delivered by him. And while his kind of ignorance is fueling this, he's not the butt of the joke in these instances. And I think that's part of what makes them so funny. The first one that I found to be really funny is when he is tearing the skeletons apart in episode 10 and is having just the time of his life. I've really loved that scene. I thought it was just wonderful. Not even necessarily in a laugh out loud way, but just in the heartwarmingly awful way. I really liked it. I liked that scene in general just because everybody's kind of feeling badly about beating up Percy's ancestors. <laughs> 
The next one is also in that same episode. It is when, I believe it's Keyleth says, you'd have to be insane to jump into this pit of acid and Grog is already ripping off his pants and jumping into the pit of acid, like with just eagerly. And then the moments of him being in the acid were both intense and exciting and also funny, especially when he's like yelling underneath of it and is like shocked by how much it hurts. Yeah, it's a little sad, but it was also really funny. In the acid? You have to be insane to go in. I'm going in. And then the third Grog moment that I want to mention that I found funny, I also talked about previously, but I want to showcase and highlight it here. Grog has already been charmed and Silas is about to charm him again. Grog knows what's up. He essentially, he succeeds on his saving throw. He says, don't try to seduce me. And Silas is just so confused and is like, I'm not, I'm not seducing you. I really loved that moment, especially just in the middle of their brutal fight where Grog was pretty much losing. He's not going to let himself be charmed or seduced again. And he shakes it off. And I think that it was such a really hilarious moment. No, I know what you're doing. Don't try and seduce me. What? I'm not trying to. Just as a kind of follow up to that, I enjoyed when he picked Silas up and told him that, you know, real men love hugs or real men hug or something like that and holds him up to the sun. That was a fantastic line. I just, I love Grog and I feel like Grog really became more himself and more akin to the character he was in campaign one in these final episodes than he was throughout much of the first season. So I'm really excited to see more of Grog in this state in season two. And I hope that that's what we get. Real men hug. All right, one last thing that I want to talk about, about the season and that is looking forward. We get a couple of hints about what's to come in the next season and I am really excited. For one, I'm really excited about the Chroma Conclave because that is a very awesome and memorable arc and a great one for them to do next. I can't wait to see what they do with it. I hope the dragons look a little bit better than Brimscythe did, but I will try to forgive them if they go a different direction because maybe this just boils down to personal taste. I would like to know if other people found the Brimscythe look to be uncanny in regards to the like fighting scene and all that. I, I just think that it looks uncanny and uncohesive so I hope they take some time to make it look a little bit better and jive better with the show because we're gonna have a lot of dragons in the Chroma Conclave art. I'm really excited for that but I'm also excited because of how much they focused on the Whispered One. I feel like that's pretty obvious now that the Whispered One is being set up as sort of this ultimate evil. So I'm really excited for the Whispered One. I can't wait to see what they do with that. I feel like we're gonna need at least three or four seasons to really get to the Whispered One and have it feel like it's earned but I'm hoping this means that they are expecting to get a couple more seasons or maybe they they just want us to be sad when we don't get the seasons containing the Whispered One. Regardless, I'm really excited for what's ahead. I'm really glad they laid the groundwork for the Whispered One. And one last thing I'm looking forward to, I was so glad that they kept in Grog picking up the sword. I know that's a really crucial thing, but you never know what they're gonna cut with these. So having Grog pick up the sword, I hope that means that I'm gonna get to see them, you know, animate and script and voice act. One of my favorite moments from the first campaign, which was when Grog is in the outhouse and he's talking to the sword, but Scanlan is standing guard outside the outhouse or just standing nearby and hearing Grog talk to the sword and Grog is trying to make all of these noises and stuff to cover up the conversation. That is such an iconic moment. I love it. I would strongly suggest that you go and watch it if you haven't seen the first campaign. It's a really hilarious moment. Uh, I'm really excited to see what to do with the sword and I'm kind of hoping that it plays a significant role in this second season. I don't want to see it just dismissed out of nowhere in season two's first couple of episodes. I think that I would be pretty unhappy about that. I'd like to see it carry on through much of season two and be a significant plot point. Consider that my wish list item, I guess, for season two. That is all that I really had to say in terms of critique and praise for the season, unless I were to go on and on and on. I've been filming for about 40 minutes now, which is a long period of filming for me. I generally film for about 20 to 30 minutes for a video. So if I keep going, this is gonna get really long and I don't want that because that is a giant pain in the butt to edit. So thank you so much for taking the time to check out this video. I really appreciate it. And I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up now. My name is Teal Bainter and I talk about stories on this channel. I have a review for Malice, the first book in the Faithful and the Fallen saga coming out on Monday, so I hope you'll look forward to that. And I'm also going to be reviewing Elden Ring shortly after, and I will continue on with the Faithful and the Fallen series too. So if you are interested in any of that or want to hear any of my other story reviews or just want to support me, I would really appreciate a like, sub, comment, all of those typical YouTube things. Thank you so much for whatever you do. If you want to see another video from me, you can do so by clicking up here. And until next time, bye.